Hey, Sander, how are you doing? Hey, Edwin. I'm hey. awesome. How are you? Great. Yeah, just had vacation, so uh, I'm uh, quite fresh to start working again. And uh, I heard that today you want to talk about something that's called the WebPub subservice, the Azure WebPub subservice. Yeah, the Azure cool. WebPub subservice. Um, so it's a new surface. It's mm -hmm. still in preview right now. And it's this surface for creating these real-time web apps uh, using WebSockets. Now, that may sound familiar to you because, as you know, yeah, we do have already have uh, such a service in Azure, which is called the Azure Signal R service. Mm -hmm. And we actually talked about that many, many moons ago. So if you want to learn more about that service, you can uh, probably click on the link somewhere and uh, go to that uh, episode yep. where we covered that one. Uh, but of course, there were also differences between these two services. And I'll uh, do a little uh, summarizing at the end of the session. But uh, hey, let's let's look at this new offering first, yeah, right? Cool. Let's dive in. Let me share my screen. So yeah, so as I said, WebPub subsurface is still in preview at the moment, and it allows you to create these real-time messaging apps by using uh, WebSockets and the PubSub pattern. So this is uh, fully managed, so you don't have to host your own WebSocket server or worry about any infrastructure at all. It supports a wide variety of client SDKs and programming languages. It, it uses the raw WebSockets protocol. So you can use basically any standard WebSocket client to send and receive messages. Um, and it supports multiple pops of messaging patterns. So for example, you can uh, send messages to all the connected clients at once. You can send messages to a group of clients or to one specific client. And it's scalable, so it allows you to go up to like 100,000 uh, concurrent connections. So let's start with a classic example for our real-time app application, which is, of course, a chat application. So for this chat sample, I have multiple instances of a client application, and then I have a server application that implements the server-side logic uh, for the sample. And then, of course, I add a web pub sub resource and I create a chat hub. Now, a hub is just a logical isolation for one application, right? So different applications can share the same web pub sub resource by using different hub names. Now, each of these chat clients would first need to connect to the web pub sub service, but for that to happen, uh, they must know the service endpoint URL and they must have a valid access token. And there are a couple of ways to solve that. So for example, you could configure each of these client applications with the connection string of the web pops up servers and then let them use the web pops up SDK to create an access token themselves. Um, in this case, I've created an endpoint on the server application that can provide all of the required information to the clients. So the first thing that happens is that the clients simply call that negotiate endpoint on the server, and then they get back all the connection details that they need to connect to the web pops up uh, servers. So now that the client has those connection details, they can connect to the WebSocket connection. Um, and then if we look at the server side, the server application can receive any messages coming in from the clients, but also events describing what's happening with the clients and the pops up server. So when a client connects, the server can receive a connect event. And to set that up, you need to register an event handler in the servers. Now, all of these events are delivered to a webhook exposed by the server application. And the web pops up service uses cloud events to format uh, that data. So cloud events is this uh, nice open standard for describing event data in a uh, common interoperable way. So now let's assume both clients are connected. And then one of the clients sends a chat message of that WebSocket connection. So that message is routed through the event handlers and arrives at the server as a message event. And now the server can decide what to do with it. So for our simple uh, chat use case, the server will then use the web pops up SDK to tell the service to broadcast the received message to all of the connected clients. And then every client will see the chat message, right? So it's a pretty basic functionality. Um, let's look at some of the code. And Sander, so you're drawing this, the, the, the web pop subservices in Azure. 
Mm -hmm. Your clients yeah. and server could run anywhere, right? That doesn't need okay. to run inside Azure. It could be a web application running somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. so they can run anywhere you like. Uh, cool. On-prem, in Azure, other clouds, where, wherever. Nice. Okay, so this is my uh, uh, Visual Studio uh, code window with uh, the solution open here. So you can see that I've got a chat client and I've got a chat server. And let's start with the server. And if I look into the CS parts file, um, you can see that I've included this azure.messaging.webpub sub uh, package here. It's still a better package because they're still in preview. So this is uh, the .NET SDK for the web pop sub servers. And using this SDK, I can create access tokens and I can send operations to the web pop sub servers, but this is only used on the server side. So going to my startup method, here I have my configured services method and there I um, register that web pop sub service client from the SDK. Here I register that for dependency injection. You can see that I include a connection string, which contains uh, the location of my uh, web pop sub service, which is real-time chat.webpopsub.azure.com, uh, and also contains uh, my access key for this uh, specific resource. And then I also include the name of the hub that I want to use, which in my case is called uh, chat. Then if we scroll down a bit, I have my configure method. And here in the use endpoints method, you can see that I've um, I've, I've exposed two endpoints, and the first of those is the negotiate endpoint. Now, this endpoint is used to generate this access tokens for the clients. So each client that wants to connect first calls this negotiate endpoint. Um, and that request must include a user ID for the client. So here I first check if, uh, if I've got an ID. If I don't have one, I just send back a bad request result. If I do have an ID, I use dependency injection to resolve that web pop up service client. Uh, and then I can use that client to generate an access URI for that specific user. And then I simply write that back to the response. So the client receives it and can use it to connect to the web pop up servers. And the other endpoint is this event handler. Uh, webhook. So that's the webhook that will get called by the web pop soft servers whenever an event arrives. And the webhook endpoint must support cloud events abuse protection uh, to agree that it's okay to send messages to it. So what that means is that an options request will be made with a webhook request origin header. And that origin header has the name of the web pop up resource in it. And if we agree, that it's okay to receive messages from that specific resource, we then respond with a webhook uh, allowed origin uh, request. So this is um, definitely not a replacement for proper authorization, which you'd still need to do in a production scenario, but it's just like a sanity check to see if the server is really expecting uh, the traffic. So once that's done, we can start processing actual requests. So we receive the events through post requests. Now, the first thing I do here is I simply uh, read the body of the request and I get the headers and I just write that to the console. So we can see what kind of messages arrive in the server. And then I check um, the type of message. I, I see if it's of type uh, message, actually. Uh, if it is, that means that it's a message sent by one of the clients. Um, in that case, I get the user ID from the message. I create this uh, little text template, which I then, using that SDK, can send to all of the connected clients. So at that point, all of the clients will receive the chat message. Um, here, I'm simply sending a text string. You can also send JSON or any other binary uh, data, if you like. So this is the entire server uh, implementation. Let me open my console window here and uh, let's run this. And while that's starting up, uh, let's have a quick look over in Azure. Um, and have a look at my uh, web pop sub servers, which I've created for this chat application. Uh, so you can see I'm using the free SKU, which of course totally free, which is very nice for experiments like this. 
Um, now, if you go into settings here, we can see uh, my chat hub, which I've configured. And here you can also see the event handler, which I've set up to forward the events to my server. So if you look in this URL template here, now, unfortunately, I cannot make, make this box uh, wider. So this will have to do. Um, you can see that I've got this ncroc.io uh, address and then this event handler endpoint. Now, because this server is running on my local machine, the web pub soft servers will not be able to call it directly, right? I, I cannot put in local host in this field. So I'm using this utility called ncroc on my local machine, which gives me this public URL that I can use. And then ncroc will forward all of the incoming traffic to my local server application. So um, any traffic going to this uh, URL here will hit my event handler webhook endpoint. Now this next field, user event pattern, is used for specifying which user or client events we want to handle. And as we'll see later on, uh, not every event coming in from a client needs to be called message. You can also use custom event names. And if you do, you can create filters here to determine which webhook should handle the event. Uh, but it's really important to note that only the first match will get the event. So if you've got multiple event handlers, um, the order in which you put them is really important. Um, I simply use this uh, wildcard asterisk uh, here to signify that I want to receive all of the user events. Um, and then you can also subscribe to any system events. So you've got a choice between connect, connected, or disconnected. And you can use these um, events to react to, uh, well, those, those things happening. For example, you can uh, do some locking or you can maybe um, uh, deny a connect request from a certain client. And then lastly, you can also enable authentication. I haven't done that yet in this sample. Um, this authentication will use an Azure AD application to create a job token that will be sent along with an event. So then your server side application can authorize uh, the token. So let's switch gears again and look at the client uh, side of this. So we can see that the server has started in the meantime. Now, if I go to the client and look at the CS Prosh of the clients, the interesting thing here is that I am using a NuGet package for this WebSocket.client, but this is just a plain WebSocket's NuGet package. I'm using this because it's a little bit easier to use and it has some uh, automatic reconnect uh, functionality, um, but I don't have any direct dependencies on a web pops up SDK or library, right? Um, so let's go over to the program. The program contains all of the code for the client. And this client takes the user ID as a command line parameter, and it then uses that user ID to get the WebSocket URL for the servers. So this get WebSocket URL method, this simply calls that negotiate endpoint to get all of the connection details. And once we've got that, we can create, uh, we can use that URL that we cut back to create a new WebSocket client. Um, we subscribe to the incoming messages. So anytime that a message comes into this client, the unmessage received method will be called, which will simply uh, write the message to the console. Um, and then we start the client, and then we go into this loop where we request input from the user and we send it up to the server. All right, so pretty simple. Let's go back to my console and let's start two of these instances. So maybe start one for Alice and let's start another one for Bob. Then let's go back to the server output because in just a short while, we should uh, see some connect and connected events from those two clients that are now starting up and trying to connect to the servers. There we go. Okay, we scroll uh, up a bit. We can see that we get a connect event for Alice and we get a connected event for Alice. Um, and then if we scroll down, you can see the same for Bob. So I connect for Bob and I connect it. So now my clients are connected to the server. And if I now go over to client number one, which was the client for Alice, 
I should be able to say hi to Bob. So let's type hi, Bob. Um, and of course, I will also see the chat message because the message is going to the server and then it's going to all of the clients and I'm one of the clients. So if you go over to client two, which is Bob, we of course have received the message and I can hi back to you. And of course, this will be visible in client one. So this works perfectly. Um, if I now look at the server logs, uh, you can see those message events coming in uh, through the through the server side. So the server is processing those messages and spreading them out to all of the other clients. Now, up to this point, the client apps haven't used any specific protocol or sub protocol to communicate with the web apps sub service. So they simply send some raw data over the WebSocket connection and the server will receive that exact data wrapped in this message event. Um, but the web pub subservice also supports a sub protocol that adds some more features to the client. So for example, if you use that sub protocol, you can choose your own event name. So it doesn't always need to uh, be called message. Um, and using customized event names makes distinguishing and processing them on the server a lot easier. Now you also get the ability to join groups and send messages to other clients without even going through your server-side code. So that's also very nice. Um, so let me show you how that works in this uh, next demo. So first, let me just shut down all these instances. And then let's go back to the client code. Okay, so we need to change some code in order to connect using the sub protocol. So here we are creating that WebSocket client. We use the URL that we got back from the server. Only now I'm adding this uh, factory um, Lambda uh, in which I uh, actually create a client WebSocket and I specify the option as sub protocol json.webpubsub.azure.v1. So this tells the web pop sub servers that I want to use the special web pop sub sub protocol. Now, clients using this protocol are not allowed to send to all other clients. The best we can do is send to a group of clients. So after being connected to the server, I will uh, send a message to join a group. So in this case, um, we want to join the group on Netflix. Uh, and as you can see here, the sub protocol uses JSON messages. So the command in this case is join group. The group I want to join is .netflix. And then I'm also including this egg ID. So that's entirely optional, uh, but if you include it, you get back an acknowledgement for your message. Uh, so you can use it to, to make a delivery more guaranteed. And just to make sure, just make sure that the egg ID is unique for each of your messages, otherwise it will not work. Now, the last thing we need to change in the client is how we actually send the message. So previously we just sent that, that, that simple uh, text string. Now we need to send a JSON uh, message. Um, and in this case, the type of that message will be sent to group. The group will of course be the .netflix group. I'm again, including an egg ID. And then I'm still sending within this message some plain text. So my data type is text and my data is the input uh, from the user. Now, before we can uh, run this, we do need to change one other thing in the server side code. So let me uh, just save this and go to the server, go to the startup. And then we go to the negotiate endpoint. Now, by default, any client connecting to the, to the service will not have permission to join groups and directly send events. So when we create the access token for the client, which we do here in this negotiate endpoint, uh, we need to give them those roles explicitly. So let me add a little bit of code here. I'm adding a, a second parameter where I specify all the roles that the clients receive. And in this example, I've included the actual group names uh, but you can also om omit those, leave those out, and then the client will have permission to work with, uh, with any group. Okay, so 
we should be good to go now. So let me restart my server. And then go to my first clients. Let's uh, do Allison again and Bob again. And then while those are starting, let's see how the server is doing. So we again see those connect uh, and connected events uh, coming in again. So those are for Bob and I think Alice should be coming in soon. Let me just run this again to make sure that started correctly. Yeah, there we go. So when you use this support protocol, the, the first change that we see is that um, the clients will also get the connected message. Uh, so now the client will also have a, a trigger to, to react to when, uh, when it connects. Um, you can also see that we have joined the, the Netflix group and that we received the acknowledgement for that, which is uh, ID one So let's send some text again. Hi, Bob. And of course, it will be sent back to us because we are part of the group. But because we're now using the sub protocol, we do not get back the, the simple plain text string, but we get back the sub protocol message, which is this uh, JSON message, where you can see it's of type message, it's from the group, the group is on Netflix, and it has my message in it. Now, if we look at uh, Bob's side again, of course, he also received the message. And uh, you can send another message, hello world, whatever. And Alice will receive that message as well. And you can also see those um, acknowledgements for the messages. So this works basically pretty much the same as before, only now it's wrapped in those uh, pops up um, protocol um, JSON messages. But now the interesting thing is, if we look at the server logs, um, no additional logs have been written. So everything the server has done is just handle those connect and connected events. But the server did not receive any message events because these operations that we did did not involve our server-side code because the clients will just communicate directly through these servers. And that is really great that my server-side code doesn't have to do any processing for this because now I don't have to worry so much about the scalability of my own server-side process. Um, now, another thing with the sub protocol, I've already mentioned that you can use custom event names with this sub protocol because right now all the events are still called message. So let's switch to a little bit of a different type of demo uh, to look at that. Um, so let me first kill all these clients and let me go over to my Edge browser to my serverless ponies demo. So this is a game that I created together with my daughter. Um, it's a fairly simple game where you need to take care of horses. So you need to log in and then you can join a game session. Um, so let me join this game session. I'm the only player here, but let's start anyway. Um, this is my, my farm and uh, I can uh, click on one of these boxes. I can buy a horse and then put it in its enclosure and then I need to take care of it. So I need to brush it to keep it clean and I need to give it some food and drinks. And then I get some points if I do a good job and the more credits I have, the more horse I can buy and it, it keeps, keeps my daughter occupied. Okay, so this front end here is um, created in Blazor and the back end is running in Azure Functions. And all of the uh, communication between the front end and the back end is done using the web pops up servers. So let's look at some of the code for this. So I'm going to need to open another solution. So let's reuse this window and then go into my serverless ponies codes. Uh, source new keyboard. Okay, so this is my serverless pony solution. Uh, let's click these away. The client application is my Blazor application. The function application is, of course, my function backend. Uh, and there's also this messages project here that contains all classes that are used both by the, by the front and the backend. Now, just as with my previous demo, the client needs to know the web pops up URL and needs to get an access token. 
So again, I've created an endpoint on the backend to provide that information. And you can see that here, it's this login uh, function. Um, now what's very nice is you can install an Azure Functions extension that makes it really easy to integrate web pops up into Azure Functions. So in this example, you can see that this function returns an object of type web pops up connection. And that object contains all the connection details that the client needs. Now this function is triggered by this HTTP trigger. So it's triggered by an HTTP request. And if you look at the route parameter, you can see that a route includes a user ID. And next, this function uses this web pops up connection input binding to automatically get the connection details from the web pops up servers. And this binding takes two parameters, the name of the hub that we want to use, which is called ponies in this case, uh, any user ID for which we are creating uh, the access token, which I get from the HTTP route. And then that binding will give me this web pop sub connection object, which I simply return to the client and I'm done uh, generating the access token. Um, then if we switch over to the client, let's, let's see how this got called. So in the client, I have this game server class. In this class, I have a login method. And here we can see that we use a simple HTTP client to call that uh, login endpoint. Um, we get back that connection info object, we parse it because it's a, it's a JSON object. Uh, and then we can get the URL from that. Again, using that URL, I can um, start a WebSocket um, connection and I specify that I want to use the uh, sub protocol. Now, even though this game is multiplayer, my clients do not directly talk to each other. Everything is going through the server because there's a lot of gaming logic running on the server. Uh, the reason I'm using the sub protocol here is that I want to use those custom event names. So at this point, the client has established a WebSocket connection to the servers, and now the player must join a game session. And the client can signal to the backend that the player wants to join by sending a join event. Uh, and this is what that looks like using, uh, using the sub protocol. So again, sub protocol uses JSON messages. The type of message that I'm sending here is event. And then in event, I can specify my custom event name. So this event's name is join. Um, in this case, I'm not sending a plain text string, but I'm sending my own JSON uh, document. So data types JSON, and then data contains the JSON data that I want to send, which simply includes a game session ID that I want to join. And then I send this uh, message over the WebSocket to the servers. Now let's um, go to Azure and let me show you my web pop sub service resource for this application. And let's go into settings. And you can see that I've set up a, uh, an event handler for the Azure function backend. Now to set it up the first time can be a little bit tricky because the way that it works is that you first need to get an app key for the function. So if I go over to this other tab, this is my backend function. You can go to app keys. And because I'm using the web pops up extension for Azure Functions, I've now got this web pops up extension app key. Uh, it's hidden by default, but uh, you need to copy this key and you need to include that in your event handler. So going back to my event handler reg registration for the URL, I'm using the location of my Azure function, which is serverless ponies, uh, 1805.azurewebsites.net. Um, I've both fixed that with runtime slash webhooks slash web pops up, which is there because of the web pops up extension. And then I need to include that application key in a code query parameter. And if I do all of that, then uh, the Azure function will know that the call is authorized and everything works. So going back to the, uh, to the server, 
let me open that up, go back to my Azure function. So this is the Azure function that handles the join event. And here you can see why it's so useful to have those custom event names, um, because using this web pub sub trigger, I can now tell this function to trigger whenever a custom join event comes in through the ponies hub. So that makes it very easy to, um, to correlate uh, processing logic to a specific event. And this web pub sub trigger binds two parameters for me. So the first one is this connection context object, which contains general information about the connection, such as the user ID. Uh, and then the other one is this uh, binary data uh, message, which contains the incoming message data. Now, this specific function also needs to call out to the web pub sub server. So for that, I'm using a web pub sub output binding. And that gives me this I async collector for web pub sub operations. And all you need to do to publish messages is to add operations to that collector. So looking at this message body here, uh, the first thing I do is I deserialize the incoming message. I get the game session ID from the message and the user ID from the context. And using those, I create a new add user to group uh, command, which I send to the web pub subsurface by adding it to that iAsync collector. So after this function has run, my player will be in the same group as the other players for this game session, which is the whole point of joining a game session. And then of course, I have a lot of other uh, Azure function endpoints which handle different types of events. So uh, if you look uh, down here, you can see there's also a start game session function which reacts to a different event that comes in from the client. So that's how you can use the web app subserves in combination with, um, with Azure functions. So let's go back to my slides and look at some uh, differences compared to the SignalR servers. Uh, so First off, SignalR service uses SignalR library, of course, uh, which is widely used with .NET, but also as clients for JavaScript, uh, for Java. There are also clients for C++ and Swift, but those are uh, unsupported. Now, the web pub sub service, of course, uses plain WebSocket. So any client that can create a WebSocket connection can be used to send and receive messages. And the nice thing about the SignalR servers is that it can automatically downgrade the connection to either server sent event or long polling when WebSockets aren't available. And that is something that the Azure Web Pub Sub servers cannot do. Uh, however, it's, it's probably becoming less important over time with so many platforms supporting just the, the plain WebSocket standard. Now, the Web Pub Sub servers, on the other hand, also has some unique features. Um, for example, that ability of the clients to communicate directly without even going through your uh, backend code, which is which I think it's a, a really useful feature. Uh, but other than that, the services are really familiar at this point, uh, really similar, I should say. Um, one of the most important differences right now is that Web Pub Service is still in preview. And the signal R service is generally available. So that's definitely something to consider if, you've, if you're ready for a production scenario right now. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, very similar. Um, so it will be really interesting um, to see how they will position these services uh, going forward. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's basically everything I want to show you today, Edwin. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for showing us. And is there any, you know, estimation when this will become generally available or is that not? I'm yeah. not sure. I think it's been in preview or in public preview uh, for like two or three months. I think the public preview was just before the okay. summer. Um, so, you know, I would expect or hope to have a, a more uh, GA dates uh, somewhere this year, but you know how it goes with Azure services. Sometimes they graduate really quickly and other times uh, preview just keeps staying preview. Um, right now, if you look at documentation of Signal R servers and Azure Web Pub Sub servers, the documentation is also really similar. So they highlight the same use cases or so where, where you can use it for and stuff like that. So yeah, I'm really wondering if they're just going to keep both them alive and 
just see how it works out naturally or if they want to uh, merge them at some point or yeah 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 because the, the most of the questions i still had was the comparison um, between signal r and this service but you had a great overview for that um and like you said i think that the, the sub protocol stuff and being able to send messages between clients that are connected without ever hitting the service that yeah there are a lot of use cases that that is very uh, nice for so i think that's a great feature that they added um the only thing is I was um, thinking about is that, is it also possible to run without any server at all? So that you just do, because now your server was basically doing the connection. And then from that point on, you can connect to the group and then communicate over only. Yeah, the yeah. You, you, is it also possible to do it without it? Oh, yeah, server? definitely. So I, uh, the, the way okay. I've set it up, you, you would still see those connect and connected events. So, but that's just something you can deselect in the portal. So I could have a hub without any event handlers at all. Uh, but then, as yeah. you said, you would need to have a different way of getting the credentials, right? But exactly. you can also yeah. um, use the SDK from the client and then connect to the web PubSub servers and generate an access token. And then the client can connect yeah. to the PubSub servers with the WebSocket connection and that all works. You just need to have a client uh, which you can trust to store some yeah. kind of secret. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, so I see a lot of use cases for this service. So thanks for showing us this. And I hope everyone watching also liked it and that you can do anything. Uh, uh, and if you have a great project that you built with the Azure Web Pops Up service, please let us know because we're, all, we're always interested in that. So um, thank you for watching. Uh, please subscribe to the channel if you like .netflix, and then we'll see you for our next episode. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.